So this is a video lesson <clears throat> for the last of our topics in chapter two, payment, count if, sum if, average if, sum product, and then a little bit of help for the chapter two mid-level assignment. So the payment function, the uh, arguments that are required for it, there's three that are of concern for us, the rate, the number of periods, and the present value. And we're going to want the negative on the present value. Basically, in layman's terms, the rate is the interest rate for us per month. The number of periods is going to be the number of months that we're going to repay whatever loan or mortgage or whatever we have purchased that we have to pay back. And then the present value, the PV, is going to be how much we borrowed. We have some a uh, little bit of help here for when we bring up the payment function. It prompts us for these five arguments. We have some help here. This is a hyperlink to Microsoft Office help. This is something that you're going to most likely want to start doing as part of this course, but then mostly for when you do go out into the workforce. It's very handy. Microsoft Office has some pretty good help, and you can see here that it walks you through the payment function with the syntax, etc giving some remarks and giving some examples with answers. Now, I'm not expecting you to learn this on your own. Like I said, I am going to be going through this sheet with us today, but that's something that when you are working maybe in other classes or when you're out in the workforce, that's going to be a handy resource for you to jump into the Microsoft Office help. And you can get there via Google. For anyone who's doing the current second semester math of finance course, you do actually cover these topics. Um, they're part of the <clears throat> annuities and loans and mortgage topic. And this would be the formula that you would see in that particular course. You can see in the argument window here, I have a picture of it. We have the five arguments, rate, and per, PV, FE, and type. Have some help along the side here for us for our notes. This is also accessible when you're in the actual actual argument window where you see, you know, in the diagram here, we have the rate is the box that we're in, and it gives you the explanation for what the rate is. Okay. So the rate, we have to recognize that it has to be the interest rate per period for the loan or mortgage or for the amount of money that we're borrowing. And per period means that if we've borrowed um, money to buy something, say a boat or a house or a car, something like that, maybe we're making monthly payments, so we'd need the monthly interest rate. If we were making uh, quarterly payments, we'd need the quarterly interest rate. For our purposes, we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to look at the, the monthly rate. The N per is the total number of payments for the loan of or the amount of money we're borrowing. And here you'll see in your math of finance course that the number of payments, the payment period has to follow the rate period. So if I'm making monthly payments, I'm gonna need the total number of months. And typically you have loans or mortgages for a number of years. So you'd have to go the number of years times the periods per year. So if it's two years, we'd have two times 12 or 24 months. If we had, say, two years and our, period, our payment period was quarterly, so we'd have four periods per year. So two years times four, that would be eight periods total. The present value, that's going to be the total value of all our loan payments. Or in other words, it's the amount of money we're getting now from the financial institution to be able to purchase whatever it is we want to purchase. We're going to see when we first use the payment function that if we don't put a negative, so you can see up here, there's a negative in front of it. If we don't put a negative there, our payment's going to come out negative. So if we want the payment to come out positive, we need to put a negative in front of that value. And that's just so that, you know, when people are recognizing, you know, you go to an institution and say, I want to borrow some money to buy a car. The first thing you ask is, well, what are my monthly payments going to be? And if somebody tells you mine is $450, you're going to look at them and go, well, it doesn't make sense. You just want to have them tell you it's $450. Okay. So to take care of that in the functionality of Excel, we'll have to put in the negative. And then for the future value and for the type, the future value, the assumption is, is that we're paying off the entire amount of money that was borrowed. So the future value by default will be zero. And we can see here it defaults to zero. And the type, we could be making payments when we're purchasing things at the beginning of the month 
or at the end of the month. And we're going to do the default where the payments are at the end of the period. Okay. And again, I need to make that a little bit bigger. So when payments are due, so zero means that our paying at the end of the period, one paying at the beginning of the period. And those of you in the Math of Finance course will see that this formula will change slightly when you have the beginning of the period, okay? And again, so these last two would be default, defaulting to zero. We could leave them blank, but it's good practice to actually put in the value. So let's look at our scenario over here. We have the purchase price, say of a boat or something else. Maybe we're putting a down payment on it. And if we put a down payment on it of say $1,000, then we can see that the amount we'll need to finance is 29,500. I'm just gonna take that out for now. So just to have a little bit of functionality. We're looking at just the default. The number of payments per year is gonna be 12. And our interest rate, our APR, our annual percent rate is three and a half percent. But remember our rate has to be the rate per the period we have. So here, since we have monthly, we're going to need a monthly rate. So we're gonna to have to do a calculation for that. And this, whatever we're purchasing, we're gonna pay it back over five years. And we could manually calculate the number of payment periods. Let's take a look here and try to use our payment function. So equals PMT, like before, to find a function. Choose your function. Bring up your argument window. Let's put everything over here. So the rate, we have our APR, and we're going to have to divide that by our payments per year. Okay, because we needed the, the rate per period, not the rate annual number of periods. Well, we have the five years times 12 payments per year, C14 times C12, and 60. So notice here to make this more functional, we're not putting in the 12, we're actually referring, referencing cell C12. And depending on where we were saying, maybe copying the payment function, we'd have to review as, you, as normal, what type of cell references we need. For this application, we can just leave these as relative. Now for the present value, if I put in my amount to finance here and just leave it as a positive value, you can see that the result comes out as negative. So we'd prefer not to quote a negative answer to somebody. So we just come up here and put a negative in front of the present value. And now our payment comes out positive. And again, we could leave these as omitted or we can put in zeros. Okay, it's not going to change the final answer because we're going with the default. And we can just go, okay. And there we have, this is our monthly payment for whatever it is we were purchasing that cost $30,500. If we say, maybe look at a house we want to buy, maybe it's $525,000. Uh, we'll make it $525,000, not $5 million. <laughs> Maybe we're putting down a $25,000 deposit. So the amount of financing would be 500,000. We'd be making 12 payments per year. If our APR was 350 and we're paying over five years, we'd have really hefty monthly payments. We could maybe change this to uh, 10 years and we can see that the payments are coming down a little better. Okay. So that's pretty much is your payment function. And I'm just going to put everything back to the original values. Let's take a look now at the next sheet. We have down here the count if, sum if, and average, average if functions. Oops, and it didn't come over. So there we go. So these are functions that are counting things, adding things up, or averaging things given a particular criteria is met. That's why it has the if as part of it. We have a data set over here to the right in columns E to K, and we have order numbers, date, driver names, items that were being delivered, the number of items that were actually, so there were 25 TVs, how were they transported? They were transported by truck and specifically truck number four. And these particular items, this delivery went to Boston. So we have the destination. And it's just a very small table for us to take a look at. 
We can come over here and say that maybe my little company, I need to know how many times am I delivering to Boston? So we can come into here and we can see that, well, there's our count if function. So I can click in the box in my formula bar and see that it's highlighted the destination and the condition or criteria it's counting is Boston. If I come up with my argument window, we can see how, well, there's the range. That's the column K with the destinations and we've entered in Boston. And we can see that there are four occurrences. Now I've added a feature to this particular sheet. These little drop down arrows here, that's a filter. If you go to the data, you can see here, the data tab, you can see here in the sort and filter group, there's a filter icon that we can use. We will use that again later in the course, but introducing it right now. And if I wanted to check that I got that right, I could come over here, use the drop down arrow, take away, select everything. I just wanna look at Boston and we could see, yep, there's only four instances of Boston. So what we did worked. So let's go back over here and let's try some of these other ones. Let's see how many times microwave orders were delivered. And we can see that microwaves are in our column H. So we'll go equals count if, choose your function, argument window, just put it to the side a little bit here. We want microwaves that's in our column H so we can highlight our range of cells, so the H8 to H31. And then we wanted to know microwaves. And notice when I put in microwaves, I get an answer of zero. But I come over here and it's just like, well, wait a minute, I can see a microwave right there. Well, again, remember, we have told Excel to look for text and we have to be able to look for exactly what's there. So now if I fix the microwave instead of microwaves and I navigate out of that box, we can see that now it is picking up all the instances. So just watch out for your criteria, make sure you're spelling it correctly, okay? And okay, so we get five instances. And again, we could come up here and filter on microwave and we can say yes, there were five. So I'll bring that back now. Let's do the next one. Let's see how many times truck three was used. Maybe in our small company, we have a maintenance schedule for our trucks and maybe truck three is due for maintenance. So I have to see, or due for maintenance after being used maybe say 15 times or maybe five times, whatever it might be. So we're going to need to check how many times, there we go, truck three was being used. So that's gonna be in column J. So let's go here equals if, and sorry, we needed count if. Bring up our argument window. Now again, the trucks are over here. So we can highlight the trucks in column J8 to J31. And our criteria is truck three. And again, we don't see an answer right away. So a good practice is to navigate out of that box, see what your answer is before you just click OK or enter, All right? And again, we could check that. We want to chuck three and we can see, yep, there's three, six, seven, eight instances of it. So that remember, you know, Excel is, um, we're using it to try to make us more efficient, make us more productive. So this would be a quick way of scanning our data sets. Let's do the same thing for the number of times that Peter White drove. Maybe if he's, um, if we're underutilizing him or maybe he's being really um, very, very productive, you know, maybe we want to increase his usage or maybe we want to give him a bonus for his particular usage. So let's try and do this one equals count if choose your function, argument window, where's the information we want to find, what information do we want to find, we want to find Peter White, make sure we're spelling it right, navigate out and we should have six occurrences of this and we can go okay 
And if we wanted to, again, we can double check, bring up Peter White, and there are his six instances. Now this last one, here we were using text for most of the things we were looking up. We can also look up numerical values and numerical values with expressions. So you can see here that if I bring up the argument window, we've looked up in column I, and column I is the number of items, and we want all the times that the number of items was less than 20. So maybe we're looking for trucks that are not maybe being filled to capacity. So let's try and reproduce this. So I'm just going to delete it and we'll go equals count if, choose our function, argument window, highlight the number of items. And we can see here that this is a numerical or a number field. So there's our I and our criteria. We wanted less than, oops, we wanted less than 20. Now notice here, I don't have any double quotes around it because you know I'm expecting numbers here, right? So this is an expression. But if I navigate away from the criteria dialog, you'll notice that Excel has put double quotes around it. So if we go back into that, the criteria is the condition in the form of a number, expression, or text that defines which cells will be counted, okay? So just watch out for that. You know, we've, we've seen before how text can give us some issues. I find this is one of the reasons why I do like the argument box a lot, because if I just try to start typing things in, perhaps I'm putting in improper syntax. So there we go. Now, if we had wanted to say, for example, count the number of times a truck was used, not just truck three. So let's maybe put under here, number of times a truck. was used. So let's just fix the formatting on that. Let's see if we can pick up now all the different trucks because we saw over here, I'm going to try and make some of these columns a little narrower so we can see more of our data. We can see here that we have truck three, four, five, one, two, etc., or one, two, three, and four. And we want to count all the trucks. So in order to do that, we can go equals count if, spell your function correctly, <laughs> choose your function, argument window. We can again select the column that has, or the cells that have the trucks in it. So we're notice we're not, we're not selecting the entire J column. It's just the actual information. We're not actually also including the header. So watch out for that. And this time we want truck. But as opposed to typing in truck one, truck two, truck three, truck four, I can use a wildcard key. And the wildcard key in Excel is the asterisk. So it's saying truck, space, and then the asterisk. So any character that comes after. And again, I'm, I'm currently in the cell, so it's not showing anything here. But if I navigate off it, it shows you that it's going to be truck with the asterisk. And there's 22 occurrences of truck one, two, and three sorry, one, two, three, and four, all counted together. So if you want to um, count something that has, you know, multiple or different endings, you can use your wildcard key at the end or even at the beginning. And we can see that would be 22. The next function we're looking at is sum if. So we're going to be doing something similar to count if where we were looking for something, what are we finding and where were we finding it? So we're doing that part again, what are we finding and where are we finding it? But now we also have to tell it, what do you want to actually sum up or add together? So if we took, take a look at our pre-populated cell, our cell C18, and we see that we want to sum the number of refrigerator items, we can see up here in the formula bar that well, we summed column H, H8 to 31, we looked for refrigerator occurrences, and then we summed column I. So we summed all the instances of refrigerators and added up all those items. So let's take a look at that. We got 105. So I'm going to do a refrigerator here. 
Okay. And we can see here, we can add these numbers. So that's 75, 85, 90, that's about 100. So what does that come to? Let's bring this back. And we got the 105. I must have missed added, <laughs> all right? So you can see that it's summing the values in here. So the 25 plus the 15 plus the 25 plus the 15. And then there's another 25 down here. Okay, let's try that for summing the number of washing machine items. So equals sum if, we'll do our argument window. So where do we want to look things up? We want to look them up in this H range, H8 to 31. What are we looking up? Well, we want to look up washing machines. So make sure we're spelling it right. Okay, go to the next tab. And then what do we want to add? We want to add the number of items that correspond to the rows with washing machines. And we can see that that comes to 164. Do the same thing with the sum of the items that had been transported by truck four equals sum if, choose our function, argument window, and again, items transported by truck four. So we have to first look at the where we're or how we're transporting things. We want truck four. And then we want to add the number of items that correspond to truck four. And we get 156. And please notice that when we're using this sum if function, we do for the sum part of it, it has to be a numerical field, okay? It has to be something that we can perform a calculation on. So we get our answer 156. Let's sum all the items that were transported by trucks. So a little similar to what we had up here where we're just counting the number of trucks, but this time using sum if. So equals sum if, choose your function, argument window. Now we want again, the transport information. We want any truck now because it says just transported by trucks. So truck with the asterisk symbol. And then again, we want to sum up or add together all the occurrences where we had trucks. And we can see we get 511 there. So that's our sum if function. The average if function works very similarly. We're looking for something. Where are we going to look for it? And then what is it now? We want to, instead of add together, we want to average. So <clears throat> for example, we have here, what's the average number of items that were delivered on February 1st? So we can see here that February, the dates are in column F. So there's where, where are we looking up? What are we looking up? The actual date. So previously we looked up text or we looked up numbers. Now we can actually look up dates also. And then what do we want to average? Again, we're averaging the number of items. Let's try and do the ones below equals average if. Choose our function, argument window. Now we want the items, average items delivered by John May. So we need to find John May first. Put in our criteria, making sure we're spelling it correctly. And then highlighting the cells that we want to calculate the corresponding average for. So look up in the G8 to G31, the occurrences of John May. For each of those occurrences, pull out the value in column I, the number of items, and then calculate the average of all those different items. And we get the 22714. And I'm just gonna reduce the number of decimals there to bring it to one decimal place. Let's do the same thing for the average items transported by truck three. So equals average if, choose your function, argument window. We're looking for trucks this time around. So we highlight the trucks 
in our J8 to 31. We only want truck three, so we can type in truck three. And we want the average of the corresponding items from column I, and we get 2275. And we'll just reduce that decimal to make it match. So these are just some nice um, little functions that help us to find things a little more easily than say, you know, using a filter and counting all the occurrences or other possible methods. Okay. Now we have to anticipate that we're not going to have, you know, very small data sets like I have here in this sheet. You know, we might have hundreds or thousands of rows to search for. So that's where the true power of these functions can come into play. Now in your chapter seven, um, simulation training and simulation exam, you have these functions, but you also have the count if s, sum if s, and average if s. Now all these functions are a little bit of an add-on for the course. Your different programs have asked for us to include them. Um, you will not find them in the exercises, the chapter two exercises. They only appear in the simulation trainings and exam for chapter seven. Okay, so if you're worried about having to use these in your assignments, you will not have to. Um, you'll notice I am not going through the sum if or count if s functions um, in this lesson, because again, the expectation is you're going through the training and the exams. Now, the last thing I would like to cover in this particular lesson is a little bit of help for our chapter two mid-level assignment. And I told you that it was one of the most challenging assignments in the course, not from the perspective that the Excel is difficult, but from the perspective that you have to think, you have to really think through what you're trying to do. So here's a practice one for you to try and maybe practice before you actually jump into it so you get an idea. You can see here that we have a small spreadsheet with number of dependents for an employee, their hourly wage, the number of hours they worked, and we want to be able to calculate their regular pay, overtime pay, gross pay, taxable pay. This is a US example, so they have a federal withholding tax, they have a FICA again, and then they have net pay. Now this is where in your first semester math course, you did do payroll and calculating regular and overtime pay. So that shouldn't be new to you. If you've had any type of job, you recognize that your gross pay, which is your regular pay plus your overtime pay, that's not what you get in your pocket. You get taxes taken off, so then you wind up with a taxable pay. Taxable pay, or sorry, you get um, taxes taken off only on a certain percentage of your gross pay, so you have a taxable pay. Then you might have some deductions like we have here. And then what we actually get in our pockets is the net pay down here. So some of the relationships are pretty straightforward. If we take a look at gross pay, gross pay is just regular plus overtime. Okay. Taxable pay, well, we have taxable pay is going to equal our gross pay minus, and then we have here a deduction, C12 times C22. And C12 is my number of dependents. And C22 is a deduction that I'm able to make per dependent. Okay, And notice the cell references. The federal withholding tax, you can see here how we're using our VLOOKUP function. So we're looking up. What is it we're looking up? Our taxable pay. We're looking it up in this table here. So we look up our taxable pay. Notice how it is ordered. We have a tax rate that then we're going to pull out depending on our taxable pay. And then we're going to multiply that tax rate by our taxable pay. So there's some withholding taxes. We then have the FICA. And we have some different example, uh, different notes down here that you can you know, read through to help you understand that just like your assignment does. So FICA is calculated on the employee's gross pay. So FICA. We can see here that FICA is the gross pay multiplied by the FICA rate. And again, notice the different cell references. And then for our net pay, well, the net pay is just the gross minus the withholding tax minus the FICA. 
Okay, so minus these deductions. And these different little explanations are down here. What tends to confuse people in this assignment is number one, the different types of cell references. So relative cell references, relative and absolute, relative and absolute, and again, relative, relative and absolute, relative. And then beyond the different cell references, these two columns, the regular pay calculation and the overtime pay calculation are the two most difficult ones. Because in both of these, we need to do an if statement. And you're going to find that it's beneficial, especially when you have say more complicated uh, applications to work with, sort out your if statement before you actually start doing your work. So you can see here that we have some recommendations. Try doing your calculations by hand first and then see how you're going to program or tell Excel how to calculate it. When we develop these types of formulas up here using functions and calculations, we are effectively telling Excel what to do or pseudo programming it. So it's always best, as I said, to try and sort things out on paper first. So we're gonna take a look at my little camera here. There it is, it took a little bit to come up. And we're gonna try and sort out, okay, how are we gonna calculate regular pay? So for the Abram, so regular pay is just gonna be the hourly wage. And I'm taking the names right from the spreadsheet. And we're gonna multiply that by our hourly hours worked. But we have to be careful here because it's not really hours worked, okay? It's hours worked only if we're working our typical or regular or base hours. And we can see down here that we have the base number of hours is 40. So for Abram, Abram worked 48 hours. So his regular pay should only be 40 times the 995. So here, we shouldn't have hours worked. We should have base hours. And if we tried the calculation, well, the base hours was 40 and his regular hourly wage was, where is it, 9.95 per hour. So it would have equal to, in total, if we multiply that out, $398. Now, as I said, it's best to walk through it first to see what it is, and then check the cell references. So where were the base hours? The base hours were down here in our cell C19. So this is going to be C19. And we're going to want absolute cell reference there because everybody has the base hours of 40. I'm trying to focus that a little better. And I think I'm gonna zoom it up just to improve the visibility here, just give that a second to resume. There we go, that's better. And then for our hourly wage, well, the hourly wage was in, where is it? That's column D and it's D12. Okay, so now we have a relationship for calculating somebody's regular pay, provided their hours are more than the base hours. Let's look at overtime pay. So overtime, I'm just gonna go OT. So overtime pay, what's that gonna to equal to? Well, it's going to be our overtime hourly wage times my overtime hours. Okay. And the overtime hourly wage, well, that's gonna be our regular hourly wage and that we're going to have to multiply by 
our overtime rate. And you can see down here, we have an overtime rate of 1.5. And then the overtime hours, well, that should just be our hours worked minus the base hours. So if we take a look here, well, hourly wage, we saw that before, that was the 995. Okay. And her overtime rate, we can see that here, that's down here in C20, that's 1.5. And then the hours worked for Abram, well, that's over here, it's the 48, so that's E12. And then that's going to be the base hours, 40. So again, let's do the cell references. So the hourly wage was 995. And that was in our cell reference, D12. We can leave that as relative because we want that to change for every employee. For the overtime rate, that's down here. Where's my overtime rate? In C20. And again, every employee will have that same overtime rate. And then our hours worked. So the hours worked was E12. And again, we're going to want that to stay relative, different for each employee. And then the base hours, well, we saw that before, that was C19. And again, absolute cell reference. So now we have expressions for regular pay and overtime pay. But before we can actually put that into Excel, we have to recognize that, well, wait a minute, sometimes people will be earning or working more than the base hours and sometimes they'll be working less. So we're gonna to have to use an if statement. So let's try and do the if. And let's check the condition. Is the hours worked? Is that less than the base hours? And again, let's put in the references. So that's E12. Is that less than base hours? That's our C. 19. Okay, we're going to check that. If it's true, what do we do? Well, our regular pay, let's look at that one first. Our regular pay should equal this. If the number of hours we worked is less than the base hours, it's just going to be the hours worked. times our hourly wage. So we're going to have our hours worked. So where's our hours worked again? That's E12. And we're going to multiply that by our hourly wage. And the hourly wage is D12. Okay. So that's if we've worked less than the 40 hours. Let's do the other side of that. So let's just push that up a little bit so we can see the if statement. If it's false, so remember the if statement says, check a criteria, do something if it's true, do something else if it's false. So now this would be, we worked greater than 40 hours, then what's our regular pay going to be? Well, our regular pay would be, what's it going to be? Our regular pay is going to be <clears throat> E12 
<coughs> excuse me, our regular pay is going to be the base hours times our hourly wage. And again, the base hours is going to be our C19. And we're going to want absolute cell reference because that's for everybody. And then our hourly wage is our D12. Now remember, we're calculating regular pay here. So we only want the 40 hours times the hourly wage. Here we'll want the hours under 40 times the hourly wage. And this is where we'd have to now put that into Excel. So you can see here that I've got the answer for the first one for Abram of 398. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to delete that cell and we're going to reproduce it. So we're going to go equals if, choose your function, argument window. Now what are we going to check here? We're going to check is the number of hours that Abram worked, is it less than, I need my less than symbol, whoops, and I'm clicking too much, is my number of hours worked less than the base hours? And I'll want that base hours, absolute cell reference, okay? If that's true, then all I'm gonna do is calculate my hourly wage times the hours worked. If it's false, I'm going to need my hourly wage times the base hours. And the base hours would have to be absolute cell reference. Okay. And if we go OK, or actually before we can go OK, we can see that, yeah, it should come out to 398. Because if I grab my calculator and go, OK, well, base hours is 40, and 40 times 995, we get 398. So I know I've done it correctly. So let's go, OK. Let's just arbitrarily change his hours and let's change that to 38, okay? So if it's 38, notice how it now reduces. So if I go back up to my cell, come to my argument box, we can see that now while the check, are my hours less than 40? Yes, they are. So this is the one that should apply, the 378, okay? And we can go, okay, and we have that answer. So this is the, um, I'm just going to undo that. That was four, oops, this was 48. So we'll bring it back to the regular values. So keep in mind that when you're approaching this assignment, I'm not going to do the rest of it for you. Okay, you have this as practice. You're going to have to set up the same type of scenario for overtime pay. So you'll have to take a look at what to do for column G for the overtime pay. And then the rest should be relatively straightforward. So this is the challenging part of this assignment. Try to map it out for yourself on a piece of paper. It's always best to do this type of thing. Um, additionally, I know um, my previous jobs when I would have to do maybe something a little complicated, um, I not only had to figure out how to do it in Excel, I had to document what I was doing, you know, this type of thing that I have on the, on the sheet here, so that if this, if the work was ever passed on to somebody else, they had the supporting documentation for how this, the sheet was set up. Okay. So give that assignment a try. Start off with this. This was just the regular pay as far as, you know, figuring out column F. You've got the groundwork for column G, overtime pay, but you'll need a different if statement, because this if statement, remember, was for regular pay, you'll need another if statement. You can keep the same relationship if you like. You can change it if you want. Depends on how you think about it. Then you'll have to create relationships for overtime pay. Okay. So give that a try and have and try and work through it.